Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to the Maritime History Podcast. I'm Brandon Hubner, and this is Episode 3, Sargon to Hammurabi, Trade and Turmoil in Ancient Mesopotamia. In this episode, we're going to cover a larger span of time than we have covered in a single podcast up to this point. So buckle in as we look at some details about a certain Sumerian moon god and how his mythical journey can give us a little insight into the boat-building materials of pre-Akkadian Sumer. Then, we'll see how Sargon forged one of the first true empires, and we'll look at some records from Akkad that give us insight into the range and scope of Akkadian trade. We'll get an overview of the gradual changes in trade that occurred in Mesopotamia, and we'll end up at a point that is essentially the end of ancient Mesopotamia's connection to maritime history, a point that is near to the appearance of the Hittites, the end of the Bronze Age in Mesopotamia, and a sharp decline in Persian Gulf trade. Before we dive in, I also wanted to mention that the podcast is now available on iTunes and Stitcher, and the best thing that you could do to support the podcast would be to subscribe on either platform and leave a review. Podcast apps and platforms rank shows based on listener feedback, so just a few minutes of your time would be a great, simple way to support the podcast. Thanks in advance for your support, and of course, there's always our website, MaritimeHistoryPodcast.com, where you'll find supplementary material, as well as sources and further reading if you want to get even deeper into the history than we have time to do on the podcast. Okay. Let's start by looking at a few religious texts from ancient Sumer that can shed some light on the materials used to build Magar boats, and just how important these boats were in Sumer. A small caveat, though, first. It's thought that the sacred boats differed from the everyday boat used by the common person, so the Magar boats that we're about to talk about may have been only a small portion of the boats used in Mesopotamia, or they may simply have been idealized depictions of boats that were beautiful enough for the gods to have used. Either way, as with most things from this far back in history, it's a little difficult to pin down a concrete answer. Our first text involves the Sumerian moon god, Nana Suen, and his journey to Nippur. The text falls into a category of Sumerian literature called Divine Journeys, poems that describe a fictional journey made by a deity. These poems were part of Sumerian religion, and it's likely that they had some basis in religious rituals that were performed as devotion to the gods. This first particular divine journey poem describes the moon god Nana Suen as he constructs a magar boat and prepares it for his journey to deliver offerings to his father Enlil, the chief deity of ancient Sumer. Another little warning, though, Nana Suen was also called Ashim Babar, So the two names within this poem I'm about to read are referring to the same person, just so you're not confused. The most relevant portions of the poem are as follows. Swen set about constructing a magar boat. He set about building a boat and sent for reed matting. Nana Swen dispatched people to Tumul for the magar boat's reeds. Ashimbabar dispatched people to Abzu for the magar boat's pitch. Nanaswen dispatched people to Dushago for its rushes. Ashimbabar dispatched people to the cypress forest for its strakes. Nanaswen dispatched people to the forest of Kugnuna for its ribbing. Ashimbabar dispatched people to the forest of Ebla for its planking. Nanaswen dispatched people to the fragrant cedar forest for its fir wood. Ashimbabar dispatched people to the junipers of Langi and you get the idea. It seems likely that this divine poem is describing the construction of a reed boat with a wood ribbing along the boat's interior, a type of boat that was fairly common in ancient Sumer. The second text we're going to look at is a Mesopotamian royal hymn called Shulgi and Ninlil's Boat, Shulgi being the second king of the third dynasty of Ur. To me, this poem is a beautiful description of a boat that was used in religious ceremony, but it also gives us a glimpse at the way Sumerians viewed boats, the water, and really their entire world. Listen to the way the boat is described as it's being prepared for the goddess Ninlil. O barge, 
Enki assigned the quay of abundance to you as your fate. Father Enlil looked at you with approval. Your Lady Ninlil commanded your construction. She entrusted it to the faithful provider, King Shulgi, and the shepherd who is of broad intelligence and who will not rest day and night in thinking deeply about you. He, the wise one, who is proficient in planning, he, the omniscient one, will fell large cedars in the huge forests for you. He will make you perfect, and you will be breathtaking to look upon. According to your large reed mats, you are at daylight, spread widely over the pure countryside. According to your timbers, you are a sniffing serpent crouching on its paws. According to your punting poles, you are a dragon, sleeping a sweet sleep in its lair. According to your oars, you are a snake, whose belly is pressed against the waves. According to your floor planks, you are currents of flood, sparkling all together in the pure Euphrates. According to your side planks, which are fastened into their fixed places with wooden rings, you are a staircase leading to a mountain spring. According to your panels, you are a persistent and firmly founded abundance. According to your bench, you are a lofty daze, erected in the midst of the abyss. According to your glittering golden sun disk, hoisted with leather straps, you are a brilliant moonlight, shining brightly upon all the lands. According to your long side beams, you are a warrior who is set straight against another warrior. Again, this text gives us a practical insight into the parts used to build a Sumerian boat, but it also gives us a sense of just how majestic these boats could be when they were outfitted with the gold and decor of the time. And it's really a shame that we lose some of that beauty by only having relics and remains to look at. I hope that taking the time to look at those two religious texts was beneficial, but let's now get back into the flow of history. When we left off, Sumer's dynastic period had just about run its course, and we looked at some evidence of maritime exploits as taken from the royal graves at Ur. The next major figure in our history supposedly had his start in a baby-sized reed boat. And no, I'm not talking about Moses of biblical fame. Rather, I'm talking about Sargon of Akkad, or Sargon the Great, a Semitic ruler who emerged to forge an empire and conquer Sumer somewhere around 2300 BC. If you'll allow me to drastically condense this empire builder's 50-year reign into a bite-sized chunk, it's sufficient to say that he led a conquest of the major Sumerian cities and created an empire that stretched from the Persian Gulf in the south to possibly the Mediterranean, but for sure to the northwest of Akkad, all the way to the Taurus Mountains and the Semitic people there. Sargon foisted a unified political entity upon the subjugated cities, and he entrusted the administration of his empire to Akkadian men. In fact, he made Akkadian the official language of his empire, forcing the southern Sumerian cities to put their native tongue in the background. The practical result of this empire is that Sargon controlled the world's first large multi-ethnic empire, so he took advantage of his control and had the riches brought to his capital city of Akkad, a city that, surprisingly, has not yet been discovered, although we have a general area where we suspect that it would have stood. Sargon's connection to maritime history is quite significant, because an inscription left to us from his reign reveals the extent of his empire's influence, and it shows us just how far trade extended in the ancient world. The inscription reads like this, Sargon, the king of Kish, triumphed in 34 battles over the cities up to the edge of the sea and destroyed their walls. He made the ships from Maluha, the ships from Magan, and the ships from Dilmun tie up alongside the quay of Akkad. Sargon, the king, prostrated himself before Dagon and made supplication to him, and Dagon gave him the upper land, namely Mari, Yarmuti and Ibla, up to the cedar forest and up to the silver mountain, Sargon the king, to whom Enlil permitted no rival. Fifty-four hundred warriors ate bread daily before him. Whoever destroys this inscription, may An destroy his name, may Enlil exterminate his seed. Dilmun, as we saw last time, is likely a reference to a culture that prospered as a Persian Gulf trade center in modern-day Kuwait. 
Magan has come to be identified with a culture that was based at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, near the current-day country of Oman. Magan is described in Sumerian and Akkadian texts as a source of copper, stone, and boat-building timber, and it's likely that goods from Magan were processed in Dilmun as they made their way up to Mesopotamia. The last place mentioned, Maluha, is also the most mysterious, and it's for that reason that we assume it was also the furthest away from Mesopotamia. Other than its description as a source of raw material, little detail is given about Maluha, but semi-precious stones and etched beads that seem to have been from the Indus Valley region have also been unearthed in Mesopotamia. Generally, then, Maluha has been equated with the Indus Valley civilization, and some indicators to that effect have been found at Mesopotamian sites. Even after the founder of the Akkadian Empire passed off the scene, trade remained strong and wealth continued to flow into Mesopotamia. A beautiful Muric shell, bearing the name Rimush, king of Kish, attests to this wealth, wealth that flowed in even as Rimush fought to keep his father Sargon's empire intact. Rimush was succeeded by his brother Manishtu, who actually extended Akkadian control to the east and into the Iranian plateau. Manishtu was in turn succeeded by his son, Naram-Sin, the ruler who saw the Akkadian Empire at its apex. If doubt exists whether Sargon's empire extended to the Mediterranean, it's more likely that Naram-Sin's empire did, stretching from there back to the Persian Gulf. It's also during this reign that we find what is quite possibly the first mention of a military fleet. Inscriptions naming Naram-Sin claim that he assembled a fleet and sailed against a confederation of Magan cities. Although he failed to add Magan to his empire, he returned with much spoil, a result that we can see from an inscription that was lost during an 1855 French archaeological expedition. The inscription was on a vase, and although it was lost, a pressing of the inscription that once appeared says, Naram Sin, king of the four corners of the world, a vase, the spoil of Magan. A moment ago, I mentioned that the Akkadian Empire was at its apex under Naram Sin, but not long after his death, most of Mesopotamia entered a period known as the Gutian Interlude. A mountain-dwelling people, known as the Guti, had existed on the outskirts of the Akkadian Empire for centuries, carrying out sporadic raids on outer-lying Akkadian holdings. Shortly after Naram-Sin's reign came to an end, Akkadian dominance began to wane. This decline was perhaps a result of Akkadian overextension, combined with the reality that many of the city-states under Akkadian control had once been independent, and they eventually grew to resent foreign domination. A combination of unrest in southern cities and an increase in the frequency of Gutian raids in the northwest led to the fall of the Akkadian Empire, and with it, a sharp decline in the amount of trade that occurred in the Persian Gulf. The Gutian dynasty was marked by inefficient administration, poor leadership, and overall declines in trade, agriculture, and general prosperity across the board. Some historians refer to the Gutian period as being a Sumerian Dark Age, but within the darkness there was at least one light that continued to shine in southern Mesopotamia. That light was shown by the Ensi of Lagash, a ruler named Gudia, spelled with a D even though his name sounds quite similar to the people who had taken over Akkad. Gudia ruled in Lagash, and even though the Gutians could probably have toppled his city along with all the others, they chose to let Lagash alone, since its leaders were more accepting of Gutian control in the region. Gudia gained a reputation for rebuilding many of the temples in Lagash, and he is well known to us today because many inscriptions and likenesses bearing his name and image have been found. A famous statue with his name contains an inscription that details the temples he built or renovated in Lagash. The statue itself bears an inscription that is dedicated to Gudia, the man who built the temple. May his life be long. Gudia's temple building campaign bears a resemblance to that of Ernanshi, whom we met in episode 2. And it tells us that at least in Lagash, 
Persian Gulf trade was still alive and well. In fact, other inscriptions reveal to us that Gudea had trade with practically the entire civilized world. A particularly striking inscription is contained on a statue known as Statue B, but more appropriately nicknamed Architect with Plans. The statue of a seated Gudea shows him holding the plans for the temple at Ininu, while inscription around the rest of the statue, one of the longest Sumerian inscriptions in existence, tells of the offerings made at the temple and lists the numerous cities where Gudea obtained materials for the temple's construction. The beautiful inscription tells how he obtained gold from Anatolia and Egypt, silver from the Taurus Mountains, cedar from Amanus in Lebanon, copper from the Zagros Mountains, diorite from Egypt, carnelian from Ethiopia, and timber from Dilmen. It's also likely that Gudea's trade routes may have continued to reach south to Magan and Maluha, places we have already seen, but the inclusion of these two places is a bit more debatable, since they had begun to decline in power by the end of the third millennium, the time when Gudea ruled Lagash. Several decades after Gudea's death, a ruler named Utu Hengel of Uruk arose to drive out the Gutians and begin what is seen as the Sumerian Renaissance. Utu Hengel did not last long in power, but Urnamu took his place and is remembered as an able ruler and a rebuilder of temples and infrastructure throughout Sumer. He became the first king of the third dynasty of Ur, and the first Sumerian rule since the rise of the Akkadian Empire and its displacement by the Gutian invasion. During the Third Dynasty of Ur, things in Sumer began to resemble their pre-Akkadian ancestors. Irrigation canals were repaired and improved in order to promote agricultural development. The economy again became more centralized in the city-states, particularly Ur, and Sumerian ships made trips to Dilmun where they traded for goods that originated in Magan and Maluha. Trade even traveled the opposite direction, north and west up the Euphrates, and then overland to the Mediterranean. The scope and quality of trade was as good during Ur's third dynasty as it was at any time previously throughout Sumerian history. The particular dynamics of trade as it was carried out by merchants and their relationship with the state and with the temples is actually a fascinating topic, and it contributes a lot to our examination of trade in ancient Mesopotamia. So if you want to tune in next time, We'll take a closer look at Mesopotamian merchants in our next episode. Before that, though, we need to wrap up our look at the chronology in Sumer. While the third dynasty of Ur experienced what would turn out to be a brief revival, Assyria was becoming more solidified in the north of the region. Dilmun featured heavily as the transit point where trade occurred in the Persian Gulf, but the Sumerian kingdom does not seem to have controlled the northern regions where Assyria had established its independence after the Gutians were off the scene. In addition to the Assyrian growth, Sumer also had to deal with problems caused by both the Amorites and the Elamites, two people that had been brought within the control of Sumer, but had both begun to fight for their independence as the third dynasty of Ur collapsed. Much of the Sumerian collapse was brought on by a drought that lasted for years and caused the agricultural base of their entire society to literally dry up. As Sumerian cities dwindled, both in size and in power, the conquered peoples, who had no problem maintaining their allegiance during times of plenty, began to question their subservience to Sumer. As the drought wore on, a Semitic-speaking people from Syria called the Amorites began a mass migration into Sumer that further exacerbated the effects of the drought. As the collapse gathered speed, the Elamites then launched an invasion against the last Sumerian king, Ibi Sin. Three letters from the end of the third dynasty of Ur give us a glimpse into the state of affairs as Ur met its end. The first is most relevant to maritime history and tells us how Ibi Sin had sent one of his right-hand men Ishbi Era on a grain buying expedition. Ishbi Era's report details how he had obtained 72,000 gur of grain, and having heard that the Amorites were marching into Sumer, he brought the grain not to the capital city of Ur, but to Isin instead, 
He then asked the king to send 600 boats of 120 gur each, so he could distribute the grain to the various cities of Sumer. Now, a gur is a unit of measurement for grain, and the carrying capacity of a 120 gur boat would be in the region of 10 tons of grain. So 600 boats carrying 10 tons of grain each is a substantial amount of grain. Even on its last legs, we can see how Sumerian civilization still managed to carry out large-scale trade. Be that as it may, the last two letters from the trio give us a good synopsis of why the third dynasty of Ur fell in the end. In exchange for distributing grain to the Sumerian cities, Ishbi-era managed to coerce the king into giving him control of Nippur and Isin. He turned that gain to his advantage and eventually took the throne himself, contributing to Ur's demise and establishing a smaller dynasty that ruled in Isin, even as the Amorites and Elamites fought for everything else. With the end of Ibisin's reign, the third dynasty of Ur and the whole of Sumerian dominance was over. The year was 2004 BC. For the next 200 years, ambitions in Mesopotamia seem to have been focused on maintaining order and control of the cities. The previous focus on expansion and trade had been shattered when the Amorites and Elamites burst on the scene. But things in Mesopotamia were a bit more complicated than is really worth going into, considering the focus of this podcast. The old Assyrian kingdom grew steadily to the north of where Sumer once lay. But Assyria was landlocked for the most part, so maritime exploits are almost non-existent in ancient Assyrian history. Instead, their focus was on overland trade with the Hittites and the Mitanni who resided in Asia Minor to their west. The dark horse of this time period was certainly Babylonia, an independent state that didn't emerge until around 1894 BC. With the city of Babylon as its capital, Babylonia was a thorn in the side of Assyria until an Amorite named Hammurabi took the throne around 1790 BC. Hammurabi is well remembered as the man who united the disparate kingdoms of his time into the first Babylonian empire of history and pronounced his law code to the empire. In our next episode, we'll consider the impact of Hammurabi's law code upon the life and trade of Babylonian merchants. Just as quickly as Hammurabi had unified the empire, though, it began to fragment once again upon his death, around 1750 BC, and marked the start of a decline in maritime trade throughout the Persian Gulf. The once powerful Indus Valley civilization had, for other reasons, also begun to decline by this point, cutting off a main source of goods that had long been imported into Mesopotamia. Hammurabi's death began a trend that continued for at least 200 years, but in reality, Persian Gulf trade never again reached the level it had once held. The Kassite dynasty, later on, saw a marginal revival of trade around the 15th century BC, but that was only because they gained control of Dilmun, and trade still did not reach to Magan or the Indus Valley region as it once had done. When the Hittites overran Babylonia, the door slammed closed on maritime trade in the Persian Gulf, and would stay closed for almost a thousand years. That marks the end of this third episode of the Maritime History Podcast. I hope you'll join us next time as we look at the lives of merchants in ancient Mesopotamia up through the rise of Babylonia. The Code of Hammurabi contains a surprising number of provisions related to shipbuilding and the regulation of commerce so I think that it will be an interesting episode. Also, I thought it important to mention that even though we virtually reach 500 BC in our look at the Persian Gulf, there are several other civilizations and peoples that we're going to meet before we move into the Classical period. As Mesopotamia flourished, so did Egypt. The Phoenicians held a practical monopoly on trade in the Mediterranean, and the Indus Valley civilization existed on a scale that is often overlooked. There were also the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, and the mysterious Sea People, so we've really just begun our look at maritime history in the ancient world. Thanks again for tuning into Episode 3, and I hope to see you back for Episode 4. One last encouragement to connect with us at the website maritimehistorypodcast.com. And until next time... 
Thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast.